Here. Awesome. Literally by one person. We are grateful. Thank you. <laughs> we do not have to come back again and Sharon gets to enjoy her time away without thinking about coming back to this. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you again for being here, uh, spending this afternoon with us. We're excited to have you here. So we're looking forward to a couple of updates from Sharon and team, um, mostly around the new employee updates. We have a couple of board members that we're going to do introductions for. Thank you both for being here. Um, and then really getting down to our key order business, which is the 2022 annual report. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to request a motion to approve the December 12th, 2022 meeting minutes. Do we have a second? Second. All right, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. We will call those approved. It's the, yeah, first little person. Little person. Mm -hmm. And it'll start, there ah. you go. Red means hot mic, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> All right, uh, so we have, a, we have two new board members here today. Um, if you guys don't mind, we could do a really quick introduction. So. Emily and Jennifer, um, if you don't mind, could you just share what area that you represent and then maybe a one or two minute background if you'd like? I'm Jennifer Moody. Hit, I represent hit, your, hit your person. There you go. I'm Jennifer Moody. I am the new city manager for the city of Bell Mead. Beth Reardon retired. Um, she's still serving some and helping me through the transition. Um, and. I'm enjoying it so far. I am in my 15th year in local government. I've served as an assistant city manager in Columbia and in Murfreesboro, and then city manager in Tullahoma for five years prior to Bellmead. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. And I'm a Nash native of Nashville. Awesome, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for being here. All right, Emily. Hi, thank you for having me and um, thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction or the welcoming to this group. Um, I am a professor at Lipscomb University. I teach environmental and sustainability sciences and have had great relationships of, you know, taking tours of waste facilities and uh, definitely con concerned and connected to the, the issue of solid waste uh, professionally. And um, yeah, live in Nashville. I've been here eight years and uh, at Lipscomb. So I came here for the position at Lipscomb and I've been here for eight years. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, I will turn it over to Jen for the new employee introductions. Yeah, I just wanted to um, make sure everyone was aware that we've got a couple of new employees and actually one employee that um, recently just got a promotion with us. So I just want to make sure you all were aware of them. So Allie Omens, you've met her before. Um, she is uh, recently got a promotion and she's going to be doing moving beyond construction and demolition, reuse and recycling and taking on a lot more projects with our education, with food waste um, and some other things that we've got going on. Um, Simone Chut is here as well. You may have seen her before, but she's an official Metro employee as of today. So we are very excited to have her officially join us on our team um, as a zero waste specialist. So she um, manages our event container program, our events permits program, um, and does a lot of other work for the zero waste team as well, including, um, of course, all of us do a lot of education work. Um, and then I also want to introduce Donald Irves. Um, he came to our team a few months ago um, and is an engineer in training. So he's under Clay Hand. Um, many of you know Clay, who helps us with a ton of the work for the um, APR, but uh, he also has been helping us as well, Donald, um, new to the team, as well as also working on construction and demolition permit review as well, which, you know, Allie really enjoys. And so just wanted to make you aware of them. If you ever need anything from, you all can say hello. Sorry, I shouldn't have introduced you all for yourselves, but. Okay. All right, awesome. Um, I guess I'll keep it with you with a legal update. Otherwise, it's just going to be three. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess I should do it since I'm physically present. Um, 
or earn my earn my keep here. So the services Southern Services litigation, I was asked to give a little bit of an update as to where that was. Um, again, our litigation team is is still this is still um, with the courts. Waste management. So, so it's it's uh, going for oral argument on April the fourth. And if you'll recall, this was a a request for an expansion. expansion. The two arguments, basically, from waste management's point of view, is that the application wasn't reviewed in 90 days as required by statute, and then it was inappropriate to use a zero waste plan to review waste management's application because the plan had not been approved by Metro Council at the time of the application. Um, waste management's asking this be remanded to TDEC so TDEC can make a review. And we are arguing that the original application was not complete because it was not properly verified. And any argument about the validity of the plan was waived because it wasn't previously raised. So a little bit of a legal update there. Bottom line, still going. Um, oral arguments April 4th. If anything changes, um, between now and then, we'll we'll let you know, and then once we get any sort of resolution, we'll also let you know of that as well. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, ways services update. That will be. Yeah. Um, that would be me, but I'm going to start since we have some new board members with just a little bit of background on what our attorney uh, mentioned. The, the uh, uh, Solid Waste Management Act of 1991 or two created um, regional solid waste boards, and it uh, required that every county either have a solid waste authority or a regional solid waste board or be part of a region, regional board. And the state had, I believe, hoped that a lot of counties would work together. It's not the case. There's a lot of independent counties, but having worked in Murfreesboro, you might be familiar. There is a multi-county, uh, Rutherford, Coffee, and another county that worked together. Down near Chattanooga, there's like a nine or ten county region. Davidson County is its own, um, but there are some that have worked together. A lot of them stay stay independent. The Solid Waste Region Board's authority is um, sort of three things, as I recall off the top of my head. Number one, they were supposed to create a solid waste plan uh, with the goal to reduce waste per capita by 25% every year and just sort of stay below that. Uh, so the plans were created in the early 90s. Metro's first plan was 1995. We had an update in 96. Uh, we did another update in 2007, and then the current plan that we have, which is called our Zero Waste Plan, was in 2020? No, you were here. Were you here? 2019 was when it was uh, approved by the board. Um, in addition to that, the authority that uh, regional solid waste boards have is, first of all, they have to create the plan, they have to approve the plan, they have to meet annually to approve the report that you'll be hearing today. And secondly, they have the authority to approve or deny new landfills or landfill expansions. Um, and that also includes incinerators. So it's it's um, waste disposal facilities. It's not recycling facilities, but um, municipal solid waste landfills, construction demolition landfills, new or expanding, and then any sort of um, incinerators, which I don't know if we have any. I don't believe we have any in the state of Tennessee. And that is the basically the limit of the regional board's authority. Uh, if anybody is bored and interested, I could go further into uh, uh, the, um, what was the other one? Regional boards, um, total, forgot, authorities. Authorities have different powers, but we don't have one, so I will not talk about that. But thank you very much for listening, and hope that helped kind of just give you a frame of reference for the legal update. So, much more interesting than that. Uh, we have been trying to expand our curbside recycling program for way back to the Dean administration. Uh, I remember uh, pitching at our, our budget hearing to uh, Carl Dean every other week, and his response was, well, what about glass? And I thought, are you not? We want every other week recycling. So we got, um, we had a lot of support from Mayor Briley. 
Um, he was very interested in doing this, and we sort of started down a road. Um, it was actually, though, Mayor Cooper that funded it, and um, in his first um, uh, budget hearing, he, uh, he funded Every Other Week Recycling, but we faced a series of hurdles to get there because we had a contractor, Red River, that some of you may have heard of, which was terrible. And um, we were constantly reacting to, they had, they picked up 70-ish percent of our customers. So whenever they had issues, there would be thousands of customers that weren't picked up. At one point, we were over a week behind in collection. And they eventually started going through bankruptcy, which then made it even harder for us to do anything with them because we could no longer take them to court for anything. They were legally protected. We suspended curbside recycling for six weeks in December, right before Christmas, which we got eaten alive for through the end of January so that we could take our crews and divert them to pick up trash and then february ended up being the worst month of all where there a combined over six thousand complaints which i know that doesn't sound like a lot when you have 140,000 customers but compared to what we normally get uh, from then to what we saw last month it's like an 87 percent decrease because it was just so bad and of course a lot of people don't report so it was my whole street was missed my whole neighborhood was missed Finally, they went through bankruptcy. They were bought by another company. and uh, um, But we had three sort of false starts. One, where we had already sent stuff to the printer, and then we had to pull the plug. Or was it four? I think it was three. Uh, and it was just really frustrating. So we very quietly, actually we were criticized by a council member for not telling anyone. We very quietly started in about October, moving slowly towards, we didn't tell anyone, because we were afraid. <laughs> you don't want to, like, get it out there and have it taken away. And um, uh, the uh, announcement came out two weeks before it started. I was scared. I was like, what horrible thing is going to happen in the next two weeks? But other than, you know, the regular collection hiccups that you have with drivers learning new routes, because as it was, we picked up once a month, every driver knew 20 routes. And then we were taking 10 of those routes away and giving them to somebody brand new. So they trained, but when they were out for the first time on their own, they missed stuff. And so we are finally starting to see the, uh, the misses and the problems dropping as the drivers get more and more familiar with it. But I will say that every other week recycling is probably the most common recycling collection in the U.S. besides um, weekly. It is also the most cost effective frequency because you're not going to collect that much more with every week, but you can potentially collect significantly more with every other week. It's very easy to remember. The once a month thing was always complicated. I was fortunate to be the first Monday, but if you were like the second Tuesday or the fourth uh, Friday, you could sometimes get lost in the calendar when the weeks didn't start, the month didn't start at the beginning of a week. So you could be in the fourth week uh, but potentially be in the third week on a Thursday or Friday, for example, and it just always cause confusion. So we're really pleased about this. Uh, we finally feel like we're getting a little closer to our peer cities. Um, our recycling contamination has dropped again this last year, and um, we're very early on with um, every other week, too early to know if we're going to see a big increase or any increase or a mild increase in collection. But this has been, I will say, in, in my 22 careers, one of my most e exciting projects to ever work on. And uh, with Jen and I, I feel it's going to be one of our greatest accomplishments. Next greatest accomplishment, hopefully, food waste collection. Uh, really big fan of that. So uh, that these this and the hub um, Nashville... Uh, issues kind of tying together. Hub Nashville is the Metro Government Call Center. That's where everything goes. And um, uh, what we are what we are seeing with the hub cases coming through, because that's one of our barometers. When those cases go up, we know it's a problem. We can look at where that is. When we first started every other week recycling, I was like printing out lists for for the supervisors in in uh, address order, so they could see this street was missed. You know. 
four times in the last month. This street was missed. You know, we've got 18 people complaining on this street. The driver clearly didn't go down this street. But we're seeing all of that starting to uh, to drop, and I think that it's, it's all going to even out. Uh, but I just have to say a thank you to Jen and all the work that she did to... Um, to move this forward. She designed all of the stuff. You're very talented. Yeah. And uh, we're lucky to have her. Uh, I know I'm talking a lot, so I'm going to try and wrap it up a bit. The other thing that I'm super excited about is that we have the funding and support to move forward with some technology to reduce missed pickups. So there's going to be routing technology with in-truck tablets or phones. And we've done one pilot with a company called Rubicon Global. They do. They have a smart city program. They're based out of Atlanta. And their technology, um, uh, basically every driver had a cell phone. And on the cell phone, they could see the, the pathway they were supposed to go. They could let the phone tell them where to turn or they knew the route, they could do it themselves. But every time they slowed down and then sped up, it would show that they had, that would be the sort of the confirmation of collection. So the little cart dots would change colors as they went through. Um, we could sit in the office. There's a, a lady who works with us and she and I would sit there and stare at the map because we could see it live. We could see the truck moving uh, down the road and uh, we could see if they weren't going down a street and the supervisors could as well. And so it really is, it was a very valuable experience for us just starting to put our toe into this type of technology. Uh, that pilot ended last week, and we're getting ready to start another pilot. This one is tablets, very similar. Um, they have um, sensors they put on the automated trucks, and that's how they do collection verification. So when they grab the cart and tip it, it acknowledges that they have emptied the cart. So that's kind of a higher level of verification. And finally, we're contemplating a pilot um, that we'll probably have to talk to Tara about at some point, maybe maybe right now, uh, that, is gonna, that uses artificial intelligence to identify contamination in the hopper of the truck. So when, and this is primarily going to be on automated trucks, when the cart's dumped into the hopper, little cameras identify and highlight plastic bags. What did we select? Bags? Uh, plastic bags is where we're going to start. That's where we're going to start. And um, then it will also note the closest address, and then we can send those folks a, a nice little postcard saying, quit it. Don't use pl put plastic bags in the recycle. But very nicely, because Jen is probably going to write it, and it will be really nice. Um, I think that's all of my updates. I know. Sorry. All right. Any questions or feedback from the board? I have a question. Um, and it's a question about uh, contamination. How did you, how, how were you able to decrease contamination? And when you're talking about contamination, I get it now about plastic bags. But a lot of the contamination that I'm aware of or heard, have heard of is when items are not cleaned out enough before they are put in recycling. Is that, which, which are you talking about? It's, it's less about that and more about things that aren't supposed to go in there to begin with. So, for example, today I had a gentleman that, that works for us, one of the drivers, he called me and he said, can I, I've got a guy arguing with me because he's got a, a disassembled metal shelving unit in his recycling cart. Can that go in the cart? I was like, no. <laughs> uh, so, but a lot of times what we get, probably our most a uh, frequent thing is plastic bags and plastic bags full of clean recyclables. Yeah, yeah. And when that hits the facility, it's not going anywhere but in the trash. Mm -hmm. And getting people to understand, this same driver was arguing with a resident that's probably, was well, definitely from another state, but he said, where I'm from, we have a blue bag program and the, they're, they're recyclable, so I'm putting my recyclables in the blue bags and putting it in the cart. And I told the driver, please tell him, we, we can't, it's just going to end up in the trash. All that effort of separating and sorting and then putting it in a plastic bag um, means it will end up in the trash because the, the equipment is largely automated and any of, the, uh, any of you all that would like to tour the facility and see it are more than welcome to. Just let us know and we can arrange that. But the, the technology can't break open the bags. And so if it happens to break open in the process getting there, the, some of that material could be captured, but for the most part... It ends up in the trash. And so it's people putting stuff like that that shouldn't be in there. I've got some great pictures of crazy things put in their recycling carts, like 
dimensional lumber. Um, weird, you know, I've, I've got a vacuum cleaner somebody put in there <laughs> and had a lady argue that because the flower pot was plastic, we should take it. So that's, that usually ends up, uh, the type of contamination we get usually ends up being stuff like that. Oh, just one follow up. So uh, thank you for that. That's very interesting. And, and just as far, uh, as far as food contamination or just, you know, particles or whatever it is that is in it, is that an issue that, I mean, I, I hear that from, from example, our local mm -hmm. in Oak Hill, uh, that that's, that that's an issue when things are not cleaned out enough. Is that an issue? with? It methadone? can be kind of depending on what it is, you know, most like it, your plastic and some of that stuff is going to go through, it's going to be washed, but if it has, um, you know, like a greasy cardboard, it's yeah. not going to make it, you know, so it kind of depends. We do try and get people to understand that you want to have the container empty. Um, you know, a little bit of liquid isn't that much of a deal, but uh, greasy stuff, it's going to get into the fiber. It's just really not going to be ideal for, for paper or cardboard and stuff like that. So um, it is an issue. It's because it's something that happens more on the back end. It's not something that we hear about as much. But um, uh, particularly, you know, grease and things like that, getting into the, the fiber of the paper completely make that non-recyclable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I've been on the tour and recently even, and I'm wondering um, for our, our fellows who like to put all their clean, perfect recyclables into a bag, is there not a guy on the line who could just cut the bag and let it go from there? No. It's... it. It really actually doesn't work that way because you have to have all that material coming over the line and somebody standing there, you would almost have to stop the conveyor so that they could do that kind of thing. And what we really need to do is train people to not use plastic bags, to reduce the number of plastic bags they're using across the board. I'm not saying a, you know, like a statewide or a countywide ban on plastic bags, but they're, they're items that... Um, can be easily replaced with other things like, um, you know, a reusable bag when you go to the store. Um, it is not something that our contractor is remotely going to be interested in doing, and it's it's absolutely not practical. I'll also just add that it's also um, for our contractor, for them to be opening up those bags, it's not safe because yeah. they don't necessarily know what's going to be in those bags. And at the speed that it's going through, it's not efficient, it's not cost effective, and it can pose a danger to the employees that are there. So they they don't, if they can see, if it's already kind of busted open a little bit and they can see that it's good, yeah. clean recycling, they're going to do their best to try and capture it. But realistically, that's not um, going to be an efficient way that they can just continue to do that. Thank you. Does Oak Hill use a different vendor? Because all Oak Hill pickup is bagged. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they have, um, I think your recyclables actually go to the Williamson County MRF, don't they? Uh, I do. Th I think that's right. I yeah. think they do. Because uh, I think that's where trash goes to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But yeah, it's all bagged. It's all bagged in the blue, you know, clear, clear, whatever bags. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had a, a question or maybe a follow-up around the every other week recycling. So I, I know it's still relatively new, but are there metric expectations that you guys are hoping to hit for participation? So or are you able to measure that? Participation is hard. The technology that we're looking at is going to help us with participation because we don't we don't have a way to to track. Um, I was over curbside recycling back in. Uh, maybe 04 and 05 through 07, and we would try and get the drivers to use a clicker or put a you know little hashtag or something, just to any mark to, and, and it's very hard um, to do that and continue driving. So the only thing that we can, that we can use as a, a metric right now are the number of people that have recycling carts. So we have 142-ish thousand, it's over 142,000 customers, 109, thousand have recycling carts doesn't necessarily mean they're always putting it out but we know that number when we get to the point that we can actually verify collection then we're going to be able to see are more people recycling 
and uh, more people participating because it's more convenient. And then also that's going to help us identify areas where there's not as much going on so we can better target them and, you know, go to community meetings, work with a council member and get people to understand the benefit and how easy it is, um, you know, to recycle. So I think at that point we're going to be able to have some really good statistics that we don't have a good way of getting now. All right. Thank you. Um, any other questions before we continue? Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to the 2022 annual progress report. All right. Um, so I just want to go over um, really quickly. Um, this kind of gives you an idea. Um, most of this, I think Sharon kind of talked a little bit about already about the Solid Waste Region Board um, and the requirement of the plan um, that is from that 1991 Solid Waste Management Act. Um, so today we are at that annual review of the 10 year plan. And of course, our plan is the uh, Zero Waste Master Plan um, that is on our website that you all have probably seen. So let's jump into our numbers. Um, we're gonna start with our landfill numbers. So this is the municipal solid waste class one landfill reported tonnage that we've received. Um, you can see the different area um, landfills that these are going to, of course, Middle Point continues to be kind of the largest, uh, the main uh, landfill where a lot of our material is going to, followed by Cedar Ridge. Um, you'll note that um, just a couple of, of trends to notice that our out of state um, landfilled waste went up pretty significantly. Part of that was we do have a new transfer station and their landfill is in Kentucky. So that's where a lot of that material is going. Um, and then overall, our total tonnage has gone up fairly significantly as well. Well, not fairly significantly, but it's definitely gone up yep. um, a good amount. So that brings us to our construction demolition landfill. So this is our class three, four landfill tonnages that we've received. Um, Southern Services, of course, uh, here in Davidson County that receives the majority of this material. Um, you'll see the, the total landfill tons between 20, 2021 and 2022 has gone down. Um, we can make some, we don't know for sure, but we can make some assumptions that um, uh, some of that construction demolition landfill is likely going to municipal solid waste landfills, which is why um, you see the, the lower tonnage here and some of, potentially some of the higher tonnage in our municipal solid waste landfills. So it's of course just kind of an assumption based on the data that we've got, um, but that, that could be a reason for those differences. For recycling, we've gotten our public sector recycling. So that's Metro, Oak Hill, Bellme, that's everybody in the region. Um, we've broken it down into a number of different categories of different materials that are being recycled. The mixed recyclables that you see, that would be like your single stream material where everything is all mixed together. Um, so you can see we've, uh, we've increased a little bit on our public recycling, but still pretty close to uh, 2021. And all the numbers are fairly fairly in line with last year. This one, um, so your report that you have that I printed out for everyone, um, we got some numbers really late today um, that I was able to update in this presentation, but you'll see them in red in your report. Once we get all of those final numbers, we're waiting on one more bit of information. So these might be um, all correct. All of these reds might just turn to black, um, but we'll get you that final number once we have it. But they're just the last one we're waiting on, but otherwise, this is what we have reported for private sector recycling. So that's going to be, and all of this um, recycling information here is all uh, self-reported. So um, just keep that in mind when we're looking at this. It's not necessarily going to be fully comprehensive, but this is a good snapshot of the recycling that's going on um, across the, the county. Um, so the, the main thing that we're looking at is to see that um, construction and demolition, recycling, uh, we may have a, a shift in that one, um, but you'll notice that um, even without that, the 2021 to 2022, we have uh, decreased a little bit um, in those, uh, those numbers. Okay, and then, so those are our, that's the, um, the tonnage data. I'm gonna jump into our um, zero waste updates, unless anybody has any questions on those numbers at this time. Okay, 
If I do have one question about the Middle Point landfill. Mm -hmm. Is part of their number where it went down from 21 to 22, is that because they're accepting fewer communities or have changed? Do you know the answer to that? Um, we contract with Middle Point, so we have, or, I'm sorry, we contract with Republic, their transfer station in Davidson County, but our, most of our waste is probably going to Middle Point, and I stay in touch with these folks. They, they truly believe that they're going to get approval to expand, so I don't know that they're really um, accepting more mm -hmm. or less. They're kind of status quo. Well, I thought that that is what the city of Murfreesboro and Rutherford County were working at was mm -hmm. at one time when I worked there, I think 19 counties were delivering waste to Middle Point and Rutherford County and city of Murfreesboro were trying to get them to maybe keep Metro, keep Rutherford County and but cut off, the cut off uh, many of the other communities from yeah, using it. I don't know why their number would go down, I guess, is as fast growing as most of the communities that deliver waste to them. I don't see how it could go down. I, I agree. I do find that to be a little curious, especially considering, you know, the conversations that I've had with them. Um, it could be that they're trying to cut back on some of the, the other counties. They're contractually obligated to take our waste. They don't have to take it to middle point, but they've got to take mm -hmm. it somewhere. Right. Um, our contract just requires them to accept it at the transfer station. So, um, well, it looked like maybe some of it shifted to out of state is yeah. what I wonder. And you know, maybe they couldn't, middle point said you can't bring it here anymore. But it, it is also possible that just having, because the, the third transfer station, so waste management has a transfer station, Republic has a transfer station and, um, waste connections has a transfer station. It's dr almost directly across the street from Republic. So it could be that they are uh, chipping away at some of Republic's customers as well. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but it would make sense that some might get diverted there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh, also have another partial reason why this might have happened that just occurred to me. Republic has experienced uh, a lot of equipment issues at Middle Point and at their transfer station. Okay. So, and this actually probably explains a big chunk of this number. We have had to um, divert our trash from their transfer station to other transfer stations because sometimes they get so behind. It was about, it was last month, um, they were backed up for two days. And so if you, if you end up with more than an hour of wait time, you're not going to finish your route. Yeah. And um, they were almost completely shut down. The waste was completely out of the building with a line all the way down Lebanon Pike, if you're familiar with where that is, where, where their transfer station is. So in that, those cases, then we get permission to go to waste management or waste connections. And we did that last month. Now, that wouldn't show up in these numbers, but we had to do that a fair amount uh, um, last calendar year because of um, equipment and collection issues at the uh, landfill. So for example, just, you know, maybe not interesting, but they, part of the way that they empty trucks is with a tipper. The, they literally uh, back the, like a tractor trailer backs up onto the tipper, it unhooks from the cab, and then they literally tip that whole transport truck for the waste to come out. When that piece of equipment goes down, I don't know how many they have, you're stuck, you can't unload anything, and then everything starts backing up. So I would say there's probably several different reasons why, but I know from our perspective, and that was something I didn't think to pull out the numbers of what we took to waste connections and waste management, but it wouldn't be this whole difference, but it probably would be a chunk of it, because I think last year we picked up, what, about 175,000? Sure. Something like that. It's about what we do usually, and it wouldn't have been, um, you know, as much as 40,000. So maybe, you know, 15. I'm just noodling this aloud here. It, it sounds like, um, you know, we have the zero waste plan that we're meant to be enacting. Yeah. Uh, and part of denying the expansion of the landfill here in Davidson County for CND was meant to push on them, you know, do more recycling that you promised to do, that you built facilities for. 
on site? Do we have their recycling numbers or do we truly think that they're just doing, relocating their items to a regular landfill as opposed to a C and D landfill? And then I have a follow up question too. Yeah. So Jen might have a little more information on this. I don't know if you have what uh, the SIDS folks did last year. I, I don't have the numbers off the top oh, of my okay. head. I don't know if you've got them in your head, Clay, but we do have two new recycling yeah. facilities that opened up. What was it? In, in the end of August of last year, um, in response to uh, Southern Services cutting off outside. So if you were, um, let's say, um, uh, LRS, hauling uh, roll-off containers. They stopped all out non-waste management vehicles from going to Southern Services so they could keep that airspace as long as possible and use it for themselves. So what ended up happening is that some other folks came into the market. Um, we have somebody that opened two C&D recycling facilities in August. So we're just looking at, so it's end of August. So it was September, October, November, December. So not a huge amount of time. Uh, waste management is also at their um, MTech facility. They have a, uh, uh, an area where they can uh, recycle and pull some material out. Um, they are also doing that, and they're looking to expand that. Uh, we met with waste management, I think it was January, and they're looking at how they can aggressively start doing uh, C&D recycling at their facility here in Nashville. So... Being it this close to the end of the fiscal year, we don't have as much tonnage as I think we're hopefully going to see in the future, but there's definitely been more of a shift. Having three recycling options in Nashville is not something we've had in a very, very long time. And it, and it is exciting to see that um, that coming, that these folks are uh, seem to be very interested. They've spent the, um, what's his, the company's name? Try try in yeah, they've spent a fair amount of money you know buying two pieces of of land going through the permitting getting the equipment doing the separation um, I've yet to go by and see it but we're really I think it could be a game changer for us on on diversion to have waste management with the facility and these folks with with two facilities and the follow-up question is similar um, with uh, Rutherford County's landfill due to well, when we were going through creating the zero waste plan, they were getting closer and closer to the end of their permit. And so that pressure we were hoping would uh, create solutions for reducing waste as opposed to just finding a new landfill. So I'm wondering about this out of state and how in alignment it is with our goals um, the out of state, I don't know that that necessarily connects with, uh, with middle point exactly, but what one thing that, uh, Republic is trying very hard to do is to pitch other options to Rutherford County because right now, um, the, uh, Rutherford County, Coffee County, and I wish I could remember the other one, that their regional board is, um, uh, trying to stop anybody but Rutherford County from taking waste to Middle Point. And what Republic is trying to do, and, and we maybe should have had them here, but is to try and uh, sell recycling, to, you know, bring some other options that they might be able to do to reduce the amount of landfilling. It's sort of a complicated situation because, and some of you may remember this, Republic doesn't, the entire... Uh, Murfreesboro and Rutherford County don't pay anything for disposal. It is zero. And that was part of the agreement to host the landfill in Rutherford County. So um, I think what Republic's trying to do is to expand out of just the landfill down there. I mean, they're, they're a very large, they're second largest waste management company in North America. And, um, and they're trying to sell them on here. Let's have some other services that will reduce the landfilling. So I know that's something they've worked with them a fair amount. I mean, from our perspective, um, Republic could, um, uh, Rutherford County's uh, uh, Solid Waste Board 
denies us any access or denies Republic to take our waste, then Republic will have to take it to a landfill somewhere else, one of their landfills or to another landfill. But um, we are still very, very much, Tennessee is still very much heavily into landfilling. And what I'm hoping is that this there's, a, there's literally a landfill crisis in the state of Tennessee. There is very little capacity. And uh, back in the 90s, when the Jackson Law was passed, which, which meant that the regional board wasn't the only authority that got to say yes or no, the elected officials also got to say yes or no. And there's no elected official that's like, I want a landfill here. So what that did is it, it has reduced over time the number of landfills very few new landfills anywhere. I don't. I, I actually don't know of any in the state that are we would consider new, and uh, so it's it's kind of put a stranglehold on it. People aren't. Most people aren't aware that in the next three to five years, there could be. It could be very difficult, or it could start to get very difficult, to find places to put waste and. Um, I think it's, it's taking a lot of time for people to see that coming and start to appreciate what a lot of us have been talking about for years, which is we shouldn't be landfilling all this stuff to begin with. We've got to find better ways. We've got to encourage people to, to go better ways. We need to find a way in Nashville to have a system where people have a financial impact about how much they generate. You know, right now, Everything is in the general fund. You don't have any field. Like, I don't get a bill for trash or recycling or anything. Nobody who lives in Davidson County does unless they're in the general service district. So living in that scenario, it's, it becomes so much harder to get people to understand we have more than one option. And this option means uh, other materials can be created out of your aluminum cans or your plastic bottles. And maybe we could reduce what's going in the oceans and what's on the ground is litter. And this way means we just keep building a mountain of trash and um, you know, kind of turning a blind eye that there is a statewide um, concern. Demita is representing Davidson County as I'm representing Davidson County on a regional task force. Uh, with all the county um, uh, mayors included, the county solid waste directors included, and we had our first meeting, um, I think, in February. And throughout the room, you could tell people realize we don't have unlimited space. There's a publication um, that we get every year showing the landfill capacity, and you may see a landfill that says 30 years. But if Nashville, if we couldn't take our waste to Murfreesboro, and all our waste went to that landfill, it would be closed in a heartbeat. And that's what, that's what people don't understand is that there's a lot of waste out there. There's landfills that don't have a lot coming in, but if one, one of the big ones closes, everything is gonna shift. And then we end up with a situation where you don't have any place to take it. And then you start looking at rail and barge and you know other options. So we, we literally are, um, facing a, a crisis that I'm hoping will get people to understand that this was not a sustainable pathway to go down in the, in the first place. So to that end, you mentioned a scenario about both the crisis and it's not billable at this moment. Is the solution then to make trash billable? I think that the, the solution is, is still part of the conversation for the, for the region, but the region relies really on three landfills. And uh, uh, Middle Point's one, Cedar Ridge is one, and by county is another. And uh, none of them have a huge amount of capacity. If one were to close, none of them have a lot of capacity. Mm -hmm. And so we need, to, we need to get people to shift. And, and I'm really hoping that because this isn't a Nashville problem, you know, it's not like something that the, the, the blue city dreamt up, it's gonna impact across the state. Um, we have some folks working with the state legislature to try and uh, see what options there might be for other programs and encouraging other programs. That's all part of the, um, the task force that Demita and I attended. And obviously the first meeting, we don't um, have a huge amount of information on uh, what all the options are, but there are, county mayors from the entire region. We have, a, I think, a nine-county region. 
And uh, most of them are just, you know, just regular folks trying to figure out now, how are we going to handle this and what's the impact going to be? Because there's, there's really only three counties that have a landfill in the county and only one of them is owned by the county. The other two are Waste Management and Republic. I guess my follow-up question then, and I'll stop asking questions for a while after that, is, um, you know, is there a timeline and is that your task force that needs to be doing it or is it this board that needs to be working on those solutions or do we already have those solutions in our plan and we just need to implement them? Well, see, there's there's stuff we can do in our plan, but it doesn't impact the, it, it doesn't necessarily have an impact on the whole region and we really need to get everybody working together. This isn't a Nashville problem. This is a regional problem. So that was the, the purpose of creating the task force. And that is the purpose of having um, our, our elected officials on it, state representatives becoming aware, state senators becoming aware, and having helping to educate people that, you know, this isn't something we can turn our backs to forever. It's you know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not an alarmist. It took me a long time to, because I would be looking at those landfill capacities, and I was like, we've got 30 years. But what we're not thinking about is how much waste is coming in. And then as landfills start to close, because a lot of them are getting closer to their end date, and it gets harder and harder for counties to approve expansions because you have so much political resistance to them from the community. Rutherford County is a great example. The people that live in the community are enraged because of um, issues that they feel are impacting them. So I really believe this is a regional issue. Uh, Davidson County must continue doing everything we can to implement our plan. But to be successful, we're going to need to work together. We can't have our own little thing here without working together. We really, really need to work together. I think uh, I'm good. Okay. I have a, oh, I'm sorry. Go for it. Uh, well, I just had a question. So just going back to that uh, MSW landfill slide, um, I mean, it shows a, a, a fairly significant increase um, over 2021, and, and I understand um, the complexity of all this, and I understand all the, and I appreciate all the efforts and all that sort of thing, but I'm just wondering how do we, how do we judge this compared to apparently a goal of a 25% reduction? Oh, yeah, we're, well, the 25% is a, uh, it is a, a per capita calculation. So we have a base year, which I think our base year was um, um, 1.9 tons per person per year. And so we have to reduce that and stay below 25% every year. The state has a um, uh, two different ways of calculating it. Davidson County always meets that diversion goal because part of the diversion is diverting from, it's diverting from class one landfills or municipal solid waste landfills. So if you put it in a C and D landfill, it's diversion. I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's, that's how the 25% diversion works. It is 25% diversion per capita from municipal solid waste landfills. I'll just have to think about that for a really long time. I, I've been I thinking no about it for 30 about. years. I'm sorry. I said, I've been thinking about it for 30 years. It doesn't, I, it, it doesn't make I a lot of sense. I didn't understand at all yeah. what you said, but oh, thank you. If you put it in a construction and demolition landfill, that's considered diversion. Okay. Because the diversion is from a solid waste, a garbage landfill, uh -huh. and not, not one that you're taking inert material to. Okay. I know. It's, it's trash shuffling. They're just shuffling it around, basically. That's what <laughs> it's it sounds a, like. Yeah. It's, it's what it is. It's, it's an unfortunate thing, but it's essentially, that's the best yeah. way I can explain yeah. it. Because it's just shuffling it around. Yeah, most states have diversion goals, but I believe Tennessee is the only state that the diversion can include a lesser type landfill. That's kind of strange. Wow. 
So how it just did somebody asked about one of the other members asked about a timeline and it sounds like this is going to be a long long term problem for sure but I mean how do you how do you gauge all this towards a zero waste goal 25 percent reduction of whatever you just said and year over year I guess and yet we're diverting stuff and we're sending a lot more out of state and these I'm not criticizing anything no, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand you. how that all relates to then having a zero waste goal well waste here. Huh? it's just zero waste here. <laughs> well and waste here. No? No, it just seems like it's just it's diverting it to somebody else's community is what it sounds like and then we're zero waste but too bad Kentucky too bad Murfreesboro which I don't think is the original goal no, and probably I, isn't what you're saying but no 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 it's, please, it's not at all please elaborate because that's what it sounds like yeah so you're absolutely right we are not at the moment doing the best at getting more diversion what we're seeing is increased landfilling and that's what we've been seeing ever since i got into waste every year people generate more people throw out more it's rare to see a community that doesn't recycle ever uh, reduce their disposal so what we've tried to do and that's one reason why um we were so keen on getting all of our trash customers on recycling when we, we first rolled that out in 2002 and then making it more frequent because one of the complaints we get from people is that in two weeks, my cart's full. I've got a second cart. A week later, that's full. Then I start throwing stuff out. Um, we're trying to institute programs and um, initiatives that will try and encourage more. And one of the uh, one of the key initiatives in the zero waste plan is going to some type of pay as you throw system, where people are charged based on the amount of waste they generate. And um, today I was actually talking with the company that provide that we buy our carts from, uh, Toter, and we were talking about several initiatives they're working on and uh, um, some that they have found very successful and they really want to help us with our diversion goals. And uh, they were telling me about a city, I think it was in Colorado, that just started a pay-as-you-throw program. And the way they're, they're doing it is by different size carts. So you pay more when you have the big cart, you pay less when you have the medium cart, and you pay very little at all when you have the small cart. What they found is that all their residents just wanted the big cart until they started being built and then suddenly they all wanted the small cart because they realized that they were paying more just to throw everything away and if they put it in the recycling bin they were going to be paying less overall so it's it's sometimes difficult to roll those types of programs out and in in um, metro nashville uh, residents in the urban service district get trash and recycling collection well, actually, the charter says trash collection, but obviously they also get recycling collection now. But there's no fee. It's all in the general fund. Nobody feels anything. You know, it'd be as if you went to the gas station, they just gave you gas for free, and you just kept going, and you didn't think about, you know, I'm using a lot of fuel. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, like if electricity. I can make a decision. I can turn the light off and my electric bill will go down. Or I can put stuff in this container and recycle it and my trash bill is going to go down. And I can, you know, I can make those decisions. And I think uh, when we get to a point that maybe after I'm retired, I, I don't know when it will be. Um, every day I feel like I could retire that day, but I'm, I'm not retired. Yeah, not yet. Um, but right now we're in a situation where people literally will call and say it's free trash recycling is free because they don't they don't realize it's actually coming out of their tax dollars but they you don't see that 
you pay that bill and you just don't ever really, you don't really see it. It's not in your, it's not in your wallet. So I'm curious, um, a lot of this discussion, you're focusing on residential recycling and residential waste. Um, is there a part of this where you're also collecting data on commercially collected waste, commercial recycling, or are you just, is it everything all Well, in this report, inclusive? it's everything. It's okay. residential and commercial. We pick up primarily residential, so I can talk, you know, most intelligently okay. about that. Uh, but... Part of our part of our plans is to start um, requiring not just residential recycling but commercial recycling. Technically, now we have we have uh, one item in particular that we just don't have any way of enforcing, and we've got to figure out how to enforce it. Which is, you're technically, according to Metro Code, you're not supposed to put any cardboard in a trash container anywhere in Davidson County. But that's really hard to to manage. So for the first time this this uh, fiscal year, we're gonna be getting some compliance inspectors. They're gonna be doing a lot of things, including recycling contamination and following up on complaints. But one of the things that we're hoping that they'll be able to do um, is also look into private dumpsters or even be at the transfer station to let the hauler know they're not supposed to be picking up containers with cardboard in it. We need to move forward to a very uh, robust um, outreach into the commercial sector. Uh, we don't have the staff to do that right now, but that's where most of the waste in Davidson County comes from. Yeah, most obviously of it's commercial. quantity, if it's about diversion, yeah. the quantity is not at the household level. It's gonna be at the commercial level. 100%. And look, I would think that one of the biggest trends probably affecting everybody is how much we have delivered these days. So, I mean, I know it can't just be my household that's drowning in cardboard. I think yeah. it's everyone. And um, it certainly helps if the businesses get on board with at least cardboard recycling, if nothing else. Well, in the in the future, our goal is to have a, a system in the commercial sector similar to what we're wanting to do in the residential sector, which theoretically they also they already sort of have. But require the um, the uh, haulers, which we, we could do, to handle waste and recycling collection as a, as a total and not two individual things and provide it to everyone mm -hmm. as a requirement. USD, GSD, everybody should have a container for recycling and a container for waste. And then over time, be able to reduce that size of waste. When I was when I was first hired, one of the things I did was work with businesses on recycling, and I did a lot of waste audits. And the first thing that I always asked businesses was, do you ever look in your dumpster? Do you look in your dumpster before it's emptied? And nobody looks in their dumpster. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time at uh, Metro Public Schools looking in their dumpsters. People don't look in their dumpsters. A lot of businesses pay for empty airspace. And they're just not thinking that I'm going to be charged, you know, whatever it is, 200 bucks every time they come or 50 bucks every time they come, whether it's full or empty. Should I have a smaller trash container? Mm -hmm. Should I have a separate container for cardboard? Because I generate a lot of cardboard. And um, it's, it's one of those things that we really do need, you know, more people to try and proactively reach out into the community, educate people, and get people to think about, you know, trash is such a, you know, it's not sexy. No, it's not. Uh, and people don't usually think about it that much, but if people started thinking about how much am I paying for it and what can I do with that money, most of the time when I talk to people about their trash, they don't know who the hauler is. They don't know what color the dumpster is. You know, they don't know how much they're paying for it. It's just... Nobody cares, and we have to find a way to make people care and to start thinking about. You see a huge eight-yard dumpster behind a uh, small business, and it just I just want to go knock on the door and say, they said they, they will rent you a two-cubic-yard dumpster, and it will be a lot cheaper, and that's probably all you need. But getting people to understand that is always harder because they want the capacity. Maybe I'll have a busy day, and then I'll have that big dumpster. But there's pain, and it's really kind of unfortunate. 
I think there's a lot of this information that's in some of the zero waste slides that we have coming up too, because all the things that you all are talking about are things that we are actively working on. Um, you know, food waste, construction, demolition waste primarily, those make up a significant portion of our waste as opposed to our residential recycling or just residential household collection. So we do have some updates on the work that we've been doing and the research that we've been doing on some of the initiatives that Sharon has talked about. So. I just want to, if we want to move through those and then make sure then if you've got additional questions, I think it just might be helpful because we have a few things that we've got. That works. If that's all right. Yeah. Um, so our construction demolition um, debris management review. So as you know, construction and demolition right now, as we have calculated, is about 38% based on our waste characterization study that we did previously and then reported numbers. We're looking at between 38%, but likely closer to 50% of all of the waste generated in Nashville is construction and demolition waste. So far more than, you know, the, the plastic, yogurt tub that I'm tossing out at home and frustrated I can't recycle. Um, construction demolition waste is a huge um, area for us to be focusing on. So that's what um, Allie has been doing a lot of work on. Donald has now joined our team to work on to manage our debris management review, which has been a huge education opportunity for folks. Um, and this sets us up for the reporting structure. So at the point that we um, look at, and I'll talk about it in the next couple slides, but talk about requirements recycling for construction and demolition material. We've got the reporting already set up. So contractors, architects, permit applicants, essentially, they already know the, to expect that they have to report this information um, and they're set up and prepared to do so. So this shift would just be um, kind of requiring them to let us know some additional information. But this reporting program has been um, really exciting for us. Um, a lot of work the staff has done to review since its inception, July 2021, up until the end of uh, December 2022, they've reviewed over 2,000 um, debris management reviews. So that's a lot of work, and that was primarily up until just a couple months ago, just Allie doing that work every day and working directly with contractors um, and all of these folks, um, providing them education and getting them information about construction, demolition, recycling, and helping them through that permitting process. So um, we don't have a whole lot of projects that have been completed. So underneath that, you see the 575 use and occupancy report. So that so that UNO means use and occupancy. So after you've completed building um, your project, you get a use and occupancy approval and then you can move in. So at that point, we're able to actually get real data and reported data. Um, so we only have 575 of those. And of that, um, 24 were claiming that they were recycling and three were leaving projects. Um, and just to note that most of them are using that commingled construction and demolition recycling. So that means that instead of um, separating it into different dumpsters, a metal dumpster versus a wood dumpster, they're tossing it all in one dumpster and having it sorted out afterwards. Um, which as we mentioned, there are those two new facilities that have opened up. Um, as well as Southern Services for lead projects will accept that type of material and there's another place out of county that will accept that commingled uh, material. Um, and then that leads us in, so all of that work has been to lead up to us uh, enacting some policy and legislation around construction and demolition recycling. So from our last meeting, um, we discussed, I had this slide up, but we had a few things that were not bolded. Um, so we've been able to accomplish a few things. We've um, been working with Tara um, and legal to understand kind of those ramifications in terms of moving this forward. We've also received a third party analysis of um, kind of the differential between using landfilling and versus using construction demolition recycling. Right now, there's actually places where it's cheaper to recycle than it is to landfill. So that when you're talking about, um, are we seeing a shift? Are we actually moving? Um, it takes time for that infrastructure to come into Nashville. I mean, right now on some of the equipment for construction demolition recycling, you're looking at two years out for a facility to really be fully up and running just because they have to get equipment. Fortunately, some of these folks have already had some equipment 
that they've been able to bring in or they're hand picking material out. Um, but otherwise it's just gonna take some time, but we are starting to see that shift. Um, and it's also showing up financially for folks that are doing this work. Um, so that's gonna be huge for us as we continue to move forward as Sharon talked about the capacity issues that we are having, even though there are, it does feel like there's more tonnage going to landfill, the shifts are starting to happen with the infrastructure. And if we don't have the infrastructure, there's nowhere else for that material to go. So we have to keep that in mind when we're thinking about how we're progressing towards zero waste, is that are we, are, is that infrastructure coming? Are people looking to invest? And they are. Um, in fact, a number of different uh, companies, both Southern Services, as well as the, the new facility Triune and some others that are out there are looking to invest in this type of infrastructure to be able to, to recycle. And so hopefully we'll be able to continue moving this process forward to get it through Metro Council. Um, our goal, um, what did I have? Okay, no. Um, our goal, as I mentioned from the last uh, meeting, is we're looking to phase in different types of materials based on material markets. Because um, there has to also, in addition to be able to sort that material out from those commingled containers, somebody has to actually be recycling that material. Metal is highly recyclable, um, and concrete right now is another one that's fairly easy to manage, but some of these other materials, there's just nowhere for it to go right now. Um, so so we have to, we're looking at how can we step in this legislation to incentivize that infrastructure and those markets to develop in Nashville so the material can't be diverted. So our next steps on that, we are still working with legal. Um, probably later this spring, early summer, we'll be looking at our next steps. We're also working with the state as well um, to talk with them about it and how that might kind of work together. So we have a few more steps, but hopefully we'll have some updates on that. But like I said, even uh, just us talking about it has started to bring some folks in. And so the um, third party analysis, again, we've got more recycling facilities, um, competitive recycling rates, and we've also been given a really fantastic model for analysis for us to be able to plug in numbers, kind of understand um, these different uh, costs as uh, they might change and shift. Uh, in terms of that infrastructure for tipping fees and for recycling fees. Um, so food waste is the other one that in addition to all the other work, about one third of our waste is uh, food waste. Um, and so, of course, our ser metro services are for curbside residential customers, so it's a great place for us to start um, to expand those programs. As Sharon talked about, the, um, the different size containers, um, we would love to be able to collect food waste at the curb. Again, this is something where we need to understand a number of different variables and there has to be a market for the final product. So that compost product, there also has to be infrastructure. Right now we've got um, out in Ashland City, there is a compost facility. Um, but if we started taking everybody's food waste from um, Metro's curbside collection right now, they would not have the capacity for that. So we need to work in steps to make sure that we're building all of that up so that when we are able to roll out a program, there's a place for that material to go, and there's markets for that final product to go to. So we're really excited. We've received um, funding for a residential food waste pilot. Um, the last meeting we talked, uh, we had not officially received that funding, but we have now. We've also been um, honored from the NRDC. They're providing us techno, a technical assistance grant as well, so they're going to help us identify how we develop this program to ensure that we are collecting the right data. Um, that we are asking the right questions so that once this pilot is over, we're able to use that information to create a plan to incorporate food waste into our curbside program. So we're really excited that's gonna be about 750 households is how many we're gonna be able to capture for one full year. Um, so we're looking at how can we incorporate diverse participation across our um, across Davidson County and um, across our uh, service area um, so that we're making sure that we're understanding different demographics, different people across Nashville, how this impacts them, how they, um, they interact with a program like this, how they understand that program and what do they need, as well as then also on our end, understanding what are the logistics that would be required to be able to collect all this material. So we're really excited about that. We're hoping that that will start um, uh, July 1st, but I, that is a tentative date. Don't mark that down, don't write it down, but that is the goal. 
Um, and then next, so um, I think a lot of you had concerns like how are, are we making any actual progress? Um, and a lot of the work that we've been doing is really on that research side. We have to understand how we can implement these programs in a way that works for Nashville before we start m implementing some of these programs and policies. So while we've definitely moved some things forward and we've started to see some shifts, um, we've been doing a lot of research on, on other ways that we can keep that momentum going forward forward. Um, so Sharon talked a little bit about the technology pilots. We're really excited um, to see about the, you can see in the kind of bottom right corner, that's a, a screenshot of that um, artificial intelligence that's capturing bags versus cardboard versus other things. Um, so it's exciting to see this type of technology come out because that's going to really improve um, if we're able to tap into that, improve our ability to collect that curbside or that residential material. Um, but then also we're looking at um, other technology in terms of with our contractors. So for example, our right now we take bottles, jars, and jugs, and we don't take glass curbside in the Metro program. There are other materials that have a market. It just requires some investment in equipment. So um, we've had the opportunity to see some of this equipment, go and visit other facilities and understand what's out there and what's available so that as our contract comes to a close November 2025, we can require and encourage investment in technology that will allow us to recycle more. Um, for example, there are um, glass crushers and we've even talked to our current contractor and they've talked about potentially investing in that um, equipment prior to the end of their current contract. Um, so if we were able to get glass out of our um, curbside stream, that's huge. That's a huge amount of material. It's also a heavy material. So you'll see some shifts in the tonnage when we're able to implement that. We also um, want to be able to collect number five polypropylene tubs. So those yogurt tubs right now that um, have a high value or have a value, a marketable value, but aren't currently being collected, um, looking at getting more of the optical sorters that are available at MRFs to, um, to be able to uh, more effectively capture that material at volume so that they are able to sell that material. Um, so we've been really excited to see some of that um, that we're working on and then also have started working on researching as Sharon was talking about the universal recycling ordinance is what they're called. So requiring recycling across um, the, the commercial sector. Um, it takes a huge amount of education to do that. We've had the chance to talk with um, Austin, Texas, who's done it very successfully and we see them as one of our peer cities. Um, you know, another blue dot in a red state and they've been able to do a lot of really incredible stuff to move sustainability forward. So we had a chance to talk with them this year, um, and they uh, they have six staff members that are essentially dedicated to that program to educate folks and make sure that that um, that folks understand what they need to be doing, how to recycle right, and um, helping them also right size containers, as Sharon was talking about as well. Um, so those are just a few of the research initiatives that we've been working on. We've of course started doing some preliminary research on the pay as you throw system and the fee structure and how that um, could come into play as well as a better, um, Sharon, I believe the cost of service study was fairly recently completed as well. So getting the data so that we can make informed decisions to move these programs and policy forward and see real change. So. We're very excited about all of that work and how that's going to look over the next um, 2023 calendar year. Um, just to give you a quick update on education, because it's one of the fun parts, it's the feel good part of uh, everybody out there. So um, 2022 by the numbers, we've held a number of events this year, number of presentations. Um, we go out to community groups and neighborhood groups. Um, this photo is from Food, uh, Food Waste Awareness Week, which is coming up again here in April. Um, Emily, you were there. Um, so a, a great uh, event to talk about some of these other issues, not just recycling. We've been um, in farmers markets has been a really good opportunity for us to talk to people, um, been to those farmers markets all across the city, and we're going to continue to do that this year as well. Um, partnering with TDEC on Zero Waste Week and a number of other um, opportunities as well to get out into the public. Um, for 2023, 
One of the things that we have noticed in terms of education is while we do have materials in English and Spanish and some materials in Arabic and Kurdish, we could do a much better um, job of reaching out to our low income kind of uh, underserved rather communities that maybe don't have our multilingual communities um, that don't have the resources uh, currently available to them to understand our different programs. So we're working with the Office of Neighborhoods to, um, to, to engage community leaders to understand what those community leaders need from us um, to be able to educate their residents about recycling, composting, and our other programs. So we're excited to start doing that work um, and creating a, more resources, especially in multiple languages, um, for those different groups um, and just expanding the accessibility of our information through that. Okay, I hope that answered just a few more of the questions that some of you all had, um, but I'm sure you all have more. Yes, I have questions. Um, unless somebody else wants to start. All right. So can we circle back a little bit to talking about the fee options? Um, I know Sharon, you and I have kind of talked about some of the, I wouldn't call them sister cities, but just other cities like Seattle or Boulder where they have the opportunity or, or they've demonstrated the opportunity where they have the smaller carts, more opportunity for recycling. Um, and there's likely the, the fee piece associated with that with you paying less based on how you throw like you were talking about. As we think about some of these other pilot pieces, kind of like the food waste component and some of that, are there options for us to either recommend to council um, or whatever other authoritative body that would make this decision to start to think about what those fee options could look like. So we're not kind of piecemealing some of this piece, like some of those components together. So if the plan is to have more of a full scope, like food waste collection option, that would be an accompaniment to our recycling program, as well as just like our general waste and we're thinking about pushing that out more broadly, could we start to think about, or at least have conversations about what that would look like if that fee was outside, for at least for USD, um, if that fee was outside of the tax component, what that could look like, or how we could have present a recommendation to whoever would make that decision. So there are a number of those conversations going on right now, and um, it's, it's very likely we're going to uh, try and do a study to get a little more uh, information. And, uh, you know, we have to look at the charter. We have to look at the code. We, you know, we've got a number of things that we need to, that we need to look at and how, uh, if your property taxes are paying it, what do we do about property taxes? Do they drop? Whatever. So I um, actually had a conversation about it today, but we're probably going to, um, do a little study and try and see if we can't get some some better information and um, also looking at, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, Austin is probably my favorite peer city um, because they are, they're a southern, um, a southern city. They're very progressive. They've been able to do a lot. Uh, they still have a long way to go, but um, they are a city we look at a lot. Um, we relate more uh, to them than we do like a Seattle uh, or California. I mean, California is just like a like a whole other world with all of the uh, regulations and laws they have. So, um, but we are absolutely in the process of looking at that and thinking about, um, you know, what it would look like, how we would proceed. Um, there, there's going to just have to be a huge amount of outreach about that uh, as well. One of the things that I would share as you're thinking about fees is to be forward thinking. The cost of all of this is only getting more expensive. Just like we were talking about, it, we're at a crisis moment where the reason it's a crisis is it's not sustainable, I think, from an environmental standpoint, but it's really, truly not sustainable economically and financially for people. Uh, in Murfreesboro, I know you mentioned that already, Rutherford County sold and in the city of Murfreesboro sold their landfill over to a private company and had a 40-year agreement to not pay any tipping fees. That agreement's coming to an end. The 40 years are almost up. And so city of Murfreesboro started charging a $5 fee, 
knowing that the that fee doesn't offset the cost of I think it was well over two million a year uh, annual program. So it, w it wasn't meant to offset, but it was just meant to start putting in people's mind that the cost of your waste collection is going up. So to move them from it's in your annual tax bill that maybe your mortgage company pays and you've never even seen, right? It's not a dollar in your mind to start paying a monthly bill that's small that you can get used to that they can start to increase. Um, so I would just, having been in local government a long time, I wouldn't even start with the thought that you could offset property tax revenue with whatever fee. It's going to be and, because you never really probably can go back and reduce the property tax by the new fee, but use the new fee to do more or improve somehow. Um, I guess I'm just listening and learning, but again, I... I would hope that whatever there is that has a financial impact to residents, that there is some balancing effort to encourage commercial businesses to do more because that's really, their impact can be so much larger. Even when you were talking about glass, I think, I just think about my household. There's so few products anymore that are glass. I know there's still some beverages and things that are gonna be glass, but if you go talk to bars and restaurants, on the flip side of that, that's where you're going to collect so much more volume of glass that it, it could make a difference. Um, but that's all I just wanted to add that about fees that I know some communities are starting to think, just like you are, that we have to start somewhere with a fee. We have to start changing that mindset that garbage collection isn't free. You've been paying for it. You just haven't. It's not in a visual, tangible way to you yet. So, and it is unfortunately, I think the way that recycling has come about for most people, they're paying to recycle, but they think throwing it away is free. Yeah. And just more on that same point, uh, do the um, C and D trash generators um, and commercial businesses, are they currently subject to a fee? Oh, yeah, everybody, technically everybody pays a fee. It's just, just like uh, Jennifer said, a lot of the community members, you know, people like you and I don't always realize because we're not getting a bill, but no, everybody is paying for disposal. Well, okay. And recycling I, I in, in some but form I mean, or fashion. Okay, but are they, are these other classes, are they being charged a specific fee on top of whatever taxes they're paying? I'm not sure I follow you. Well, the C&D, the builders who yeah. are generating all the C&D um, debris and, and landfills yeah. and, and, and commercial businesses, all the restaurants, et cetera. Are they being charged by the city some fee for their um, garbage that they're generating? Uh, we, if we don't pick it up, then they're paying a private company to pick it up. If we pick it up, then it's part of their property tax bill. Okay, so they're mainly going through private like, haulers. Yeah, we pick up um, small businesses along residential routes so like one or two cards it's it's basically like an extension similar to what you might have at uh, at home so we don't do any large scale like commercial uh trash collection at all we are limited more to residential and small business the closest we get to commercial is the work we do downtown which i would very much like to get out of downtown but we do um maybe about 150 customers out of the entire downtown core. So it's very small. And, and so when they, when they pay a fee to their private haulers, does any of that come back to Metro in some way that can offset the costs that we're talking about? No, there's no, I mean, currently there's nothing that comes back to uh, Metro. Other than they, They've got like permit fees and things like that. But as far as per ton, um, there's nothing that comes back to Metro. And I don't even know that we could, require them picking up trash for a private company to pay Metro fee. But I'll have to think about that. Could be a really good idea. What about the surcharge? Wouldn't that be considered, so like 
Well, it's not the private businesses when they pay a fee. So when material is dumped at, um, at taken to a landfill, either the CND or the um, a municipal solid waste landfill, there is a surcharge. Um, so it's one dollar per cubic yard, I believe, for yep. construction demolition material, or six dollars a ton for municipal solid waste. So that money does come back to Metro. Um, we are able to charge that, but those fees are restricted in terms of how we can use them. So for example, we're able to fund some of our convenience centers and recycling drop-off sites using that funding because the state requires that those program, whatever we fund with that money is provided to everyone in Davidson County, um, all residents. So for example, we couldn't necessarily use it for a construction and demolition recycling because that's specific or you know it's specific yeah. to builders or it needs to be something that is available to everyone so we do have some funding um, that we use um, but that's not necessarily the private business they pay their fee to the the hauler but then once they get to the landfill so those kind of fees trickle down if that makes sense yes yeah. I forgot about that that's a good point and ultimately the hauler is the one who pays it back to Metro and then presumably they funnel it back to their customer. It's usually the landfill that pays yeah, it. The hauler pays to the landfill. So the private person pays the hauler, the hauler pays the landfill, the landfill pays us. Got it. Well, it just seems to me that, um, and I don't know what your, what the experience in these other cities are and whether Austin has implemented, um, you know, uh, any sort of fees on their private residence. Oh, yeah. They, they have. It just seems like that, you know, if the if the greatest amount of the of the debris that's being dealt with here and filling up the landfills is coming from construction and demolition, namely builders, a lot of builders from out of state or out of the city who are coming in and taking advantage of the situation, which is they're fine for them to do, but they are generating that um, that uh, that it, something some sort of um, compensation from them to make up for what they are what they're cost causing. Yeah, and that's where that uh, that dollar a cubic yard uh, comes in, which goes, the landfills collect, but then they remit it to um, our finance folks. Is that is that much, a dollar a cubic yard? Um, yeah, it's, um, so you have, uh, it's, it's difficult to calculate a simple conversion from tons to cubic yards, because, yeah. uh, but uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's very likely in the uh, seven figures. Yeah, if you're looking at like, for example, a large commercial construction project downtown, um, you might have, they might have 10 dumpsters on site that are getting dumped every day and they're yeah. all 30 cubic yards. And if you think about that, so that's $30 a, per each container yeah. times 10, that's $300, um, $300 a day for however long that project is going on, which is usually, what, a couple of years? Um, so it can be pretty significant depending on the size of the project. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I was like, what did I miss? Um, okay, I did have a, one additional question. Um, actually, two. So circling back to the food waste pilot, um, once the group or the areas are identified, do the individuals opt in to that program? Or are they, how does that selection process work? Yeah, that's something that um, NRDC is going to help us kind of better identify. How do we do that in an equitable way, but also make sure that we're capturing residents that are going to get us a good, solid set of data. Of course, they will have to opt in um, ultimately, but our goal is to, um, we've talked, um, just kind of started those conversations, um, talked about uh, engaging focus groups in our communities, working with the Office of Neighborhoods, again, to look at community leaders that can help us identify participants, because one of the things that we're going to want to look at is also trying to be as efficient with the routes as possible. Um, so while we do want to capture folks, uh, I mean, we want to capture someone in every district that you know our services touch and make sure that we're um, having that kind of diverse participation, we also want to make sure that we're being efficient with the, the cost and the routing as well. 
Um, so uh, we we're kind of looking at those different factors and we're gonna be developing some strategies to, um, to engage those folks, but ultimately it will be opt-in. Okay, and then um, going back to the CND piece with the recycling component, how is that regulated? So like if they're if they're gonna be required to recycle those materials and it's commingled, how are how are we as the city confirming that they're actually putting in recyclables and not just that is a great question. Okay. And part of the work that we're working with Tara on a little bit. Yeah, but also right now, whatever goes through, uh -huh. they're paying for. Okay. So when we first, uh, well, no, we've had that fee for a very long time. But in 2010, I believe it was, we increased it. And we increased it to $2 a cubic yard with the understanding that in, in the ordinance uh, that if they diverted, uh, whatever they diverted would be exempt from the fee. And if they diverted, I think it was 50% or something, um, it would drop to a dollar a yard. Um, it was extremely unpopular by the land with the landfills. And for are you talking about the legislation that we would be proposing? Mm -hmm. The um, so the way we would um, be looking at that that's kind of part of the work that we're doing um, with legal to understand how do we go about doing that. So there's kind of twofold. We've got the permit applicants themselves. They're going to be providing. The idea would be they would provide us a plan on the front end, letting us know where that material was going, um, and then on the back end. Um, kind of as a separate piece is understanding if it's going to XYZ facility, how do we ensure that that facility is doing the recycling? So can we have some kind of, um, in other states and in other uh, municipalities that are doing this, they have different ways of certifying. Some require third-party certification of the recycling facility. Um, so that's what we're working with Tara and her team to understand what can we do that, you know, um, to allow us to be able to have that verification um, based on state law. I think I don't want to overstep what I'm saying here. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's right. I mean, anytime that you're looking at making any sort of major change like that, imposing a fee or imposing an obligation on a private entity, you have to really look at state law. You have to look at the Metro Charter and look at the and federal law and look at all those things together and make a determination of if, if there is legal authority to be able to do that because it's not always an a yes, right? And so we want to make sure before we impose obligations that we have the legal authority to do so. And so we're working with Metro Waters Waste Division um, and all these different types of scenarios and see, you know, what what's the best way of, of going about this and is it permissible, basically. Okay. And the, um, ultimately, the reporting of all of this, so there potentially would be reporting, well, there likely would be reporting incorporated from those recycling facilities so that we would um, be able to get that information um, from them in terms of what materials are the recycling and where is that material going. Um, and then the permit applicant as well, after they complete that project, so when they get to that use and occupancy piece, they will have to provide us the weight tickets and the tonnage, or at least this is what is the going to be proposed, that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, the idea would be they would have to provide weight tickets and they would have to provide the information of how much material of the different specific materials. So if it's um, metal, how much metal was generated on that um, facility and went to recycling versus how much material went to landfill. So they'll have to report those numbers through the permitting process. Um, through, yeah, so through their billing permit and through the use and occupancy. Okay. So it's kind of two, the permit applicant and their plan and report, and then the recycling facility and their reporting. Okay, that's helpful. Um, are there any other questions from the board? I have one. I noticed that you mentioned the backyard composting um, section here, and I'm wondering how are we balancing backyard composting versus food waste pickup, or the goal of food waste pickup? 
Yeah, right now the backyard composting program, I mean, if you can compost at home, we're trying to educate folks and, and get folks on board for doing that while we don't necessarily have um, other options. Right now we do have our food uh, drop off, uh, food waste drop off at our four convenience centers. Um, but other than that, unless you wanna pay for private right now, um, private collection curbside, those are the options that you have. So. Our work with Backyard Composting has been to educate residents on how to get started, provide compost bins as we can. Um, so we've provided a number of earth machine compost bins for folks that take our webinars and take our um, educational workshops to encourage folks to um, that can recycle at home. Um, but ultimately we know that um, different options are gonna work for different people. You have to find that low, you know, what is the barrier to entry for folks? And, you know, recycling at home, there's a lot of people that just do not have, wanna have anything to do with that. Um, so it's really about providing as many options as we can to uh, residents um, to be able to manage that material. Any other questions? I just had a question, maybe follows that, but just about educational, uh, and I, I saw what you had in there on that. Um, I, I find recycling to is is seems like it ought to be simple, and it's not. And you know that to me is it seems to me the the largest uh, impediment to having effective. Um, Recycling. Uh, I, I know in the city of Oak Hill. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm an inveterate recycler. I have driven my family crazy for years re with re recycling, and then came only in recent years to find out that I had been re I'd been religiously cleaning out yogurt cups and recycling them. And apparently, somebody's just been throwing them away without me knowing about it. You know, that kind of thing. Now, we in, in Oak Hill, in our newsletter, we have started and have included a, a couple of articles about what, at least in Oak Hill, is acceptable recycling and that sort of thing. And I don't know how widespread the impact of that is. We could, you know, talk about newsletters, et cetera, all day. But um, that, I, it just seems to me like there's so many tripwires in recycling when it ought to be easy if we want it to be effective. I that's true. Percent agree. Go yeah, on. absolutely. And uh, one of the things that I'm considering is, especially as we're talking about households, um, multifamily units aren't covered in the uh, household pickup, and there's not requirements, as far as I know, for uh, apartment com you know apartment complexes, etc., to make those options available. So obviously, the convenience centers are one option, but that's a burden um, mm -hmm. that are that you know a large percentage of our uh, community ha doesn't have access to. Yeah, and the and I'm sure Sharon can talk to the multifamily a little bit, but one of the things with the universal recycling ordinance that we would be looking at, so something that's um, that's like that type of um, policy would allow us to then require those multifamily um, allow uh, require commercial entities and and commercial really does fall multifamily really does fall into commercial, um, so that would be um, kind of where we've been looking at in research. But then I know Sharon, you yeah. and we actually are engaged in a in a pilot and have been for some time. There's about, I think, 10 complexes that have recycling dumpsters. And, uh, uh, you know, we sort of monitor the issues there. It's multifamily recycling is, is the hardest because, you know, when it's your bin at home um, and, you know, if you have a family, everybody knows you're, you know, you're putting stuff in there to recycle it. When it's at a, you know, sort of a, a uh, random dumpster that's got a different sign on it. It gets, you know, if the trash dumpster's full, they put it in there. So it it is some of the hardest recycling you could ever do, but it's still something we see as very important. And, um, and uh, this year we've talked with our finance folks to see if there is a way that we could expand it. We're gonna need some more money to do that because we provided them the dumpsters. We can't expect uh, in, in a pilot, situation and in a situation where it's not mandated for them to go out and invest in a dumpster. So we do have a small group um, and most of them are um, uh, have HOAs with 
pretty diehard recyclers in that, mm -hmm. that keep an eye on them. And uh, we didn't pick up recycling at one place for a couple of weeks because the driver re uh, left and we had a new driver. And I tell you, I got my butt chewed. Uh, the, people are serious about it. So it's, it's something we see as a, as a priority, maybe not the immediate priority, but something that we absolutely want to do. And I think that this pilot, which we've had for quite a while now, is going to help us uh, figure out how to do it and how to educate people. Yeah, the education piece for sure. Um, you know, Austin, I keep going back to them because I remember the conversation thinking, where are we going to get this many staff members? But I mean, they have, um, I mean, they have six staff members specifically for that universal recycling ordinance to educate. That is primarily what they are doing. It is, you're, you're absolutely right. Recycling is complicated, but it's um, absolutely necessary that the education component goes along with all of these different programs, whether it's food waste, construction and demolition waste, um, or a recycling programs. Um, it's a huge part of what I'm very proud of my team. It's a huge part of what they do um, to get out into our communities, to talk to our metro employees, to talk to our residents about all of these issues and all these different programs um, so that they can be more successful. I just want to make sure that we say thank you to the staff and to you all because this has been so informative and um, I can really tell, even though this is my first board meeting, um, that you guys are so dedicated to the work you do. I know it's, I just have a little bit of experience with pilots and I think taking on these new initiatives and especially pilots is really challenging and thank you for doing that. And also just from my experience working other parts of the region, I know that many areas look to uh, Metro Nashville as the model, the trendsetter. Um, and so I just want to say thank you for the work you're doing because it is influencing the decisions um, that other communities are making. And a lot of other places are recycling and pushing for composting and thinking about incinerators or thinking about, you know, how they keep their waste local and and don't send it out of state. Um, but I think it's because they're watching and paying attention to things that you're doing here. And so I'm excited to maybe be a small part of that. Thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, I'd like to open it up for a public comment regarding the annual plan. <laughs> Uh... That's my fault. I'm sorry. No, 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 you're good. <clears throat> um, do I need to say my name again? I feel like I'm in court or something. 
<laughs> they were having a hard time hearing you and wanted to make sure that this was on public record, so. Bobby Bandy with our Savers Recycling. Um, and uh, so anyways, uh, number one, uh, I I'm, I'm very much appreciate the forward thinking of the plan. There's, there's a lot there. Um, and you guys, I guess, are part of the implementation of that. Um, and and then you guys have got to deal with the political side of that and then the logistical side of it and so forth. So a couple of observations and questions I have. Um, uh, so I'm a business trying to see where do I fit in this in the long term. Uh, and, and I'm making decisions for my company uh, based on what I see the direction of, of uh, our city going. A couple of the, I guess, I, I guess you call them bottlenecks that I see that I was hoping to get some uh, clarity on. Um, how much of a difficulty is the metro, metro Charter in taking this to the next level? Um, if I understand correctly, that has to be changed, I think, to uh, be able to charge fees. Or can you charge fees outside of that? Is that what moving to the water department where they have a utility bill, is that where that would take place? That's my first question. Um, and um, the second question is the political will for that. Um, I know that's one of the toughest things is uh, the best plant made plans can get foiled by uh, the politics of the, the, the final vote. I've been involved in several situations where it looks like something's gonna happen on the state level and it gets to committee, gets through committee, and it's about to be uh, voted on, and somebody whispers in somebody's ear, and it evaporates. So that's my, my, my second question is, what's, what do y'all see the political will and, when, I guess, the, the barriers to that? Um, and then um, uh, it seems to me that there's got to be roughly a five-fold increase of infrastructure to make this happen, right? Because you're, you're moving one thing from we're just trucking it throw it in a hole to try it to a place that has to process it and has to get it to this place and to that place and much more complicated uh, scenario. And so what are the, I, I, you've mentioned a few opportunities, but it looks like it has to go fivefold to get to the 90% diversion that you're going towards. Um, and then my last question is uh, not only process it, but then the end markets for that. Um, and I guess Austin sounds like a great uh, place uh, to, to, to learn from. What have y'all learned from that, that that maybe addresses these questions? Long, long question, but sorry. I don't know if I can uh, remember everything you said, but Bobby, we're, we're lucky to have you, and I wish every waste hauler was as uh, dedicated. I believe you guys even do food waste collection. Or we tried to do a pallet and it didn't yeah. quite run, but we're hoping to get into it at some point. Yeah, because I think a, a lot of haulers uh, uh, sort of pay lip service to recycling. Their bread and butter's trash, and, and I really appreciate the fact that you guys have, you. have always, from the beginning, it was... Um, it was about recycling and maybe a little trash too. That's right. Well, and we tried to do trash and recycling for the city of Oak Hill and we're not a trash company, we're a recycling company. It just didn't work for us. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can remember everything, but um, the charter um, is one thing that, obviously we're, we need to, just like um, uh, Tara said, we need to look at everything. Um, I don't know that it will necessarily be a barrier, but I mean, we have to look at all of those um, uh, and, you know, before we proceed. So um, that's the phase we're in right now is, um, you know, the fact finding and, and looking at everything. But um, I, I strongly believe that that people don't change their their ways uh, until they feel the pinch of whatever their whatever their dis, their their issue was. What we yeah, that's something that has to come to a vote that actually has to be voted by the, the public to, to change the charter, or is that just something that the if council? If it's the does? charter, it is. Okay. Um, but I will say that um, uh, we have, I think, uh, a point that. I would imagine most council members realize is an issue. As long as we are taking money out of the general fund, that means schools gets less money, police get less money, fire gets less money, social services gets less money, everybody else gets less money. So getting us out of that, um, I think is, is something that a lot of people see the benefit of. Okay. Obviously we see it from a slightly different angle. Um, 
because we're seeing it as how do we get people to understand the actual right. cost for this? And the way most elected officials would look at it is, is why are we using, you know, our, you know, property taxes to pay for something when schools always needs more money? And, um, you know, you want the ambulance to show up at your house and, and all of that. So um, I, I do think that a lot of people see that benefit. And um, I think we will probably have a fair amount of a fair amount of support from that, especially as they look at what can, how can we divert that money somewhere better. But is that a Metro Council vote, or is that a has to be voted by the citizens? I'm just Metro Legal, I, so I, we just really don't know right now. Yeah. Um, we're looking at a bunch of options. We're looking at how you could structure it. A di uh, um, many different ways. And so ultimately what it would depend on is which path are we taking and then how will we pursue that path? Okay. And so it's complicated yeah. to answer your question. Um, obviously we want to avoid a charter amendment. Right. Um, most things that we have to institute or that we would institute would likely require council approval because almost the, the you know, the, the fallback position is usually that council approval is required. Um, and that's generally almost always the case if you're imposing any sort of fee. Um, so I think that our team is mindful of the fact that we would need to get the word out before we undertook that sort of, you know, that sort of um, uh, political endeavor. Um, not sorry, not trying to speak for you guys, but... Um, because legally, I mean, it's not part of part of what I do, but you always have to be mindful that you know you want the votes. This is something that that we need, and and this team is very passionate about, and that we've wanted for a very long time. And so right now, we're really hoping to be able to push it through. Um, now, how that ends up looking, I couldn't tell you right now. And is that why you you guys have moved over to the uh, uh, waste the water services because they have a utility bill and it can be added to that? No, we could theoretically have done it, it over there, but the the reason we moved is that uh, the administration wanted a Department of Transportation, oh. and uh, we were the uh, we were the problem. <laughs> <laughs> But I will say we are benefiting from the fact that Metro Water Services as a department, they have a history with establishing enterprise funds and, right. and establishing. So um, history in the previous before times when Public Works was still a thing, stormwater used to be over at Public Works and that moved over to Water Services and they were able to work through that process to establish an enterprise fund so that that is now part of the utility bill. So we will benefit um, and we are benefiting from the expertise that they have to inform some of this as um, kind of exploration and research. And by the way, I think the pay as you throw approach is the right way. I think um, uh, you have to see what it costs and make decisions. I'm a subscription-based service, and that's what people do. They pay us to pick up the recycling, uh, but it's a it's, it's something that th they value, that it's worth it. We educate them, we enforce, we make sure they're complying and, and all those things, and, and it costs money to do that. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out so how... I've just been uh, a couple times hopeful for something, and then somebody uh, a um, uh, uh, somebody whispers into a senator's ear, and it evaporates. You know, and I'm sure y'all experienced that yourself. Um, and so that's the next question: is what do you see political will, uh, and is there anything that is state related versus this can all be done in, in Metro Council? You know, a lot of other cities and counties already charge. Memphis charges. Okay. Um, when I when I worked um, statewide years ago, I would say probably most cities and counties charge. I don't know, uh, Jennifer, what your experience has been, but in the different cities you worked at, where pretty much everybody was paying for trash. Well, I don't think I can really speak. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't think I could really speak to that. I think it's a mix. Um, I would say that most are heavily subsidized. So even if they are charging, they're subsidized. They're, yes, yeah. they are subsidizing what, from general fund property. Tax. Yeah, and I believe Memphis is as well. Um, I think they're trying to. They, they're not on a true enterprise fund. Last time I talked to them, but um, I. I don't think it is uncommon in the state of Tennessee for people to have a fee associated with it. Okay. 
Um, and I guess the last two were just observations. They weren't questions, but um, uh, with the zero waste plan, y'all mentioned 15 high performance action plans and 18 uh, zero waste action items, or I'm not exactly sure what the wording is. Year four in, roughly it's three or four years in, where do you feel you are in hitting those targets for the uh, 2050 goal? Well, I have to say, I really think that the pandemic put us behind mm -hmm. um, and funding has put us behind. Okay. And part of the reason that we want to try and get out of uh, the general fund is so that we can have, you know, more money to do more things. But right now, we are, we are where we are. <clears throat> and so this is probably one of our most important initiatives is to try and uh, change the funding structure. I'll also note too that, um, so the zero waste master plan um, identifies strategies based on, you know, waste reduction and reducing reliance on landfilling, but some of the work that the mayor's office and the um, mayor's offices of sustainability has been working on is to also some of the work they did 2021, I believe it was, was to evaluate all of those um, strategies as well based on uh, carbon impact as well. Um, so I will just note that um, as the mayor's office looks at some of these other factors, some of that has helped us better strategize. It's one of the reasons why construction and demolition, so between um, public surveys, between the mayor's sustainability advisory committee saying this is a, a huge carbon impact as well, plus knowing that it's a huge amount of material going to landfill, it's helped us to at least in this time um, look at how we're strategizing as well. A um, couple of last comments. Um, in the 20 years that I've been in business, there's been some things that y'all have done that's been good for us, and there's been some things that you've done that hasn't been good for us. And you're not here to make our savers happy, and I, I know that. Um, but I wanted to pass along some of those things because there's unintended consequences to when, when things happen. Um, when y'all provided the ban on cardboard and electronics, that was fantastic. Um, we were working with Oak Hill at the time, and it gave them some leverage to say, it's time to move from as much trash as you want to put in our trucks, we'll take it to let's let's limit uh, uh, trash to this amount and let's do maximum recycling. And we use that that cardboard band as leverage to say our hands are tied. It's it's law. It's regulation. But then we became uh, we sort of laughed at it within a year because there was no enforcement. And they asked, well, how are they going to enforce this? And I said, there's nothing there that I can tell you is how they're doing it. And so my encouragement is that uh, in those, that that enforcement, and uh, I think you mentioned compliance officers going through and looking, at that, that's, uh, unfortunately it's a cost, but it's something that, that you've got incentives and you've got sticks, and sometimes that's what, what you need. But that was very, very helpful. So those types of things uh, people listen to and, and matter as long as you've got some, uh, some, some teeth behind it. Um, when y'all, I heard you mention that y'all might put recycling and trash together and enforce uh, for, force holler, haulers to maybe do that on the commercial side. I think it's already semi done on the recycling side where you you had uh, uh, in the urban uh, general services district, uh, waste haulers picking up residential had to provide a recycling option. I forget how many years back that that was put in place. Yeah, that was also 2010. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and while that sounded great, uh, and it and it started off fairly well, I think that uh, y'all may even have uh, some some numbers on that actual recycling. What ended up happening is because there, I guess there, I don't know if there was enforcement or or uh, whatever, but um, that slowly deteriorated to where they would provide it if you asked but they weren't gonna tell you about it. And then there was a lot of people saw the same truck that came picked up their recycling emptied the trash cart. Mm -hmm. um, we lost business during that time because why pay two bills when you can you know, pay one? And all that made, that, that made you know, some, some logical sense from the, the front end side, but the unintended consequences of what is human nature when, when you give them that, even on the ban, what's the human nature, what are they gonna to do to try to circumvent that? Unfortunately, that's what people do. 
Um, and so my encouragement is if that's a, a direction that y'all are going on the commercial side, I'd love to have a conversation about that. Um, I think the incentives and the bans are good, uh, but when you tell a waste hauler to be a recycler too, um, and if you told me to be a waste, uh, waste hauler, I tried it once, I don't want to ever do it again. Um, uh, it's, you have different mindsets. The, the, the one person um, filling a big hole, as much stuff as I can get in the hole, stuff it in as, much, as quickly as I can. The other one is I want my, cust my customers paying me. They want to know how to do it right. I spend the time to, uh, for them. Our contamination rate is 5%. It's been 5% for 20 years. Um, and that's because our customers are paying us. They want to do it right. We explain it to them. We have the oops tags. We have the explanations and so forth. Um, so anyways, unintended consequences on things that maybe the big guys, uh, when they're talking to you, the waste management and republics, they've got their, their landfill man mentality, but the small guys like the uh, Nashville Compost and, and all those, uh, it, giving us a chance to, um, to, to uh, uh, help give a perspective on what could the consequences be. My, my concern on pay as you throw is if you do it by container size, um, people will be very creative in how to, uh, to hide their trash in the compost bin, and that would destroy national compost. If it gets in there and it's all mixed in, it, will, it, it would just be a nightmare. Um, at any rate, you can't fix everything, and you gotta, do, you gotta pick something eventually. But um, uh, that's just to say there are un unintended consequences. One of the questions I have is, uh, observations is I think that when it goes to a pay uh, program, uh, it isn't going to impact uh, lower income people more than, than the um, uh, more affluent because uh, they're not paying for it now. And so um, it, you, you, you're right, you're going to have to be creative in trying to figure out how to deal with that. But also, generally, that population doesn't recycle well either. And so you can educate till you're blue in the face and, 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 and some, and well, that's not true because even the fluent uh, in Oak Hill, I had arguments with people who, like, you're not going to tell me that I can't put that in the trash. And I'm like, I'm not picking it up, you know. But, um, uh, but anyways, uh, I, I appreciate and I'm grateful for what y'all are doing and um, uh, eager to see what the, the, the next, next uh, few years have in, in full. All right, thank you. We're gonna, we need to take a vote because she's gonna have to leave in a minute and I don't wanna lose her quorum. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, lost my thought there for a second. Okay, so uh, can I, Request a motion to approve the 2022 annual report and solid waste management plan. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And the motion carries. Um, do we have any other business before we adjourn? All right. Uh, motion to adjourn. Yes. <laughs> Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.